Energy. I want to say thank you all for being here, and I want to especially say thanks to John Watson for joining us today. Um, my name is John Hamry. I'm the president at CSIS, and just uh, I'm, my role is ornamental this morning. Um, yeah, my wife laughs at that too. Uh, <laughs> so, um, think just think this morning of one thing that you did that did not require energy. It's hard to come up with one, you know. I mean, I, my alarm went off at 5:20. Took electricity to do that. Uh, the treadmill, got electricity. The hot water to shower. That that was courtesy of uh, natural gas. Uh, my car got down here. You know, there isn't a thing that I've done today that hasn't required energy. Think of a foundation for a society, a modern society, a modern economy that is more fundamental than energy. And yet, we as a country don't think of it that way. You know, we don't really have an energy policy in America. We've got ag policy, which gives us ethanol. You know. yeah, we've got labor policy that gives us coal mines. We've got, uh, we've got uh, tax policy that gives us windmills. You know, we've got all kinds of policies <laughs> that give us energy, but we don't have an energy strategy for America. The other thing I think is tip, well typical and unique in this country is that we, we have decided we're going to put energy policy in both the public and the private sector. You know, we don't have a state oil company. You know, my dear friends at Stott Oil, you know, they get to decide what we're going to do in Norway, you know. But what do we do in America? We have, we've decided we're going to put this in the private sector. And that means that the private sector plays both a responsibility uh, for solid energy policy, but then we also need to be listening to that private sector for its insights. And that's what this series is about. So we've asked uh, leaders like John Watson to join us today for a conversation about the most fundamental part of our economy, and that's the foundation of energy. It's going to be a far-ranging, wide-ranging conversation. All of you are going to be a part of it. Uh, I believe that we're going to take questions on cards. Uh, that's so that we can make this the most efficient, so that we get quality of learning out of this rather than, uh, than fireworks. Uh, but I think we're going to have an interesting day, and I look forward to it. Frank, why don't you take over from here? John, say thank Thanks, you. John. I'd like to thank, thank you, you for coming. Delighted to have you. Glad to be here. Thanks, thank John. you, John. So let me join John in thanking John Watson uh, to be with us today. John's a veteran of the energy industry. It's 33 years now. Uh, hard to believe, yes. Ooh, and you're still a young man. Um, but the fact that the role of CEO for Chevron at this point, especially at this point in time, has to be just a phenomenal thing. When, when you go back and look at all the things that have happened in the last decade, certainly, but even the last five years, this new energy renaissance, Fukushima, you know, tidal oil, shale gas, our climate objectives, what we've done with tax policy. This just has to be a wonderful opportunity, not without challenges, but from your perspective as the CEO of a large multinational corporation. What does that mean? What does it mean to the company? What does it mean to the country? What does it mean for the world? I think John said it very well. It is, uh, it is a privilege, an honor, and some responsibility to be the backbone of the world's economy. And if you think about what's happened over the last 150 years, uh, we've seen the greatest advancement in living standards that we've ever seen on this planet. And that's been facilitated largely by affordable energy. Right. And so light, heat, mobility, industry, all the things that we value, all the things that John talked about as we were getting started, uh, are the things that give us the quality of life that we have today. And countries around the world are aspiring right. to what we have. There are a billion people that have all those good things. There are uh, perhaps five or six billion people that, 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 don't. that don't. And that's the challenge going forward, is that uh, all the peoples of the world want to have an improved standard of living. And in order to have that, they're going to need affordable energy. And so I think that's our job, that's our responsibility. And when we speak of energy policy, uh, I typically think about three things. One is, how do we produce affordable energy? Mm -hmm. Um, how do we address legitimate security issues around those energy supplies? And then we have environmental objectives. Right. But I always look at it through the lens of affordable energy because that's what governments around the world have to deliver to their people. 
So in terms of the, just taking it back to the IOC role, right? There's a number of things that U.S. companies, um, the benefits that we provide for the world, and it could be technology, it could be best practices. So in addition to delivering uh, energy for the billion and a half people that don't have it or the global population, how difficult is that and what are the benefits for, for multinationals? What special role do you have in that, in that regard? Well, I, th I, think our, uh, I think the role of multinationals in general, not just in our industry, but throughout American business is not all that well understood. If you look at the financial statements for the top 20 industrial companies, more than half of their business is overseas. For Chevron, 75% of our earnings are generated outside the United States. But half our employees are here in the United States. And those types of percentages are very, very similar. Companies that are based in the US, multinationals, still are uh, largely US driven. That's where their intellectual property is housed, that's where their home office is, where product development work often takes place. And multinationals, I think, are one of the great advantages that this country has. If I think about how challenging it is to uh, impose our will militarily these days around the world, when I think about how challenging it is to win all the arguments at the bully pulpit, uh, the one uh, vehicle for instilling American values overseas, transparency, adherence to rule of law, um, sound environmental practices, really it is American companies that have that. Now we also do philanthropy and have a number of social practices that are very good. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the role that we have as we develop energy supplies. We get brought in because of the technology we bring, right. uh, but we also, we also brought in for all those other reasons. And I think that's um, not a story that we tell well enough to the, to the American people. Right. So let me take it on a personal level now. So you came up the financial side, right? but you've also done EMP. Mm -hmm. When you look at the opportunity pool that's available to companies now and the shifting landscape that Dan's so popular talking about, how do you choose and pick um, whether it's an LNG project overseas or it's shale gas development in the United States or it's downstream infrastructure so that you get this delivery build out so that you can have a market for your product. Well, the, the irony of the, of the energy business today is we have never had a longer queue of opportunities. Right. Th there are so many opportunities, shale, deep water, uh, Arctic, conventional opportunities, uh, sour gas, all sorts of uh, heavy oil, challenged resources. <coughs> And that's right in our sweet spot. Yes. We, are, we are good at technology, at the hard things, at, at, at developments that are on the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. We make our choices based on, fundamentally on the rocks right. uh, and where, where we're going to produce and the quality of the resource. But we also base it on uh, whether we can do it uh, affordably, whether we can do it and be profitable. And, how much competition is there? How easy is it to be done? And so we think we bring a unique set of characteristics that host governments often value. Uh, I, I can uh, pick countries like Liberia, where President Sirleaf had a number of choices of companies she could have asked in. But she waited for us. Okay. And she wanted us because, uh, in her words, she said, I want a company that I can trust. I think there were a total of four petroleum engineers in Liberia at the time. <laughs> and so she said, Mr. Watson, I want a company I can trust. And, and I thought that was high praise for Absolutely. us, but I, I don't think it's atypical uh, because we've been asked into the better part of 10 countries uh, just in the last few years alone because of all the good practices that we bring, including transparency. Well, and you've been on the forefront of this license to operate uh, momentum. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at, uh, we've always viewed that uh, uh, shale gas development and tide oil, we can manage the below ground. It's the above ground issues, right? So population density, what you do with water, how you deal with emissions. But Chevron has taken a real lead in that. Well, I think th there have been some learnings. Um, sure. You know, we're not perfect. And uh, you know, we're working to get better every day. And I think the industry is also. What's clear, and I think really the Macondo incident in the Gulf of Mexico was uh, perhaps the, the turning point, is public expectations are very high. And there's no reason they shouldn't be high. Uh, the industry has gotten better. We actually do have fewer spills. We actually are getting better at what we do. But we have to keep moving the bar. One of the things that we've done recently is we formed the Center for Sustainable Shale Development in the Marcellus uh, Shale in this country. And there are already good state regulations in place. There are federal regulations that are in place. But we and a couple of other companies and some NGOs uh, and others got together and put in place 
uh, this, the center which will have 15 uh, performance standards that okay. companies can be certified against through third party, third party auditors. Um, I'm not, I don't believe any company will be certified today, but everyone is moving toward those right. performance standards. And uh, it's controversial in some quarters, both in the environmental movement and in my industry. But we think it's the right thing to do. These are standards that we're aspiring toward, mm -hmm. and we think that it's good for the industry to be moving the bar to meet the legitimate when concerns. When it's evolving and progressive, it's yeah. not just stop at this point and now you're done. I mean, there are some communities in the United States that are used to having the oil and gas business. Right. But there are others in Pennsylvania that are not. And so we have to be sensitive to what their concerns are. Um, there's, there are some risks out there. Uh, some risks have been overstated. Mm -hmm. But we have to address them either way. And I think that's what we do when we engage with communities and we put in place these sorts of entities that can uh, give confidence to the local communities. It's no different there than it is in Central Europe. Right. We, we, we're, we're going through these exact same issues there where you have to engage with communities. And there are uh, homeowners and ranchers and others that have real concerns. So you have to, you, you can say we're safe, you can say we fracked a million wells, we're th this, is, this is safe, you can say that all you want, but they want to be assured. So let me take you back to the industry piece. There's a lot of companies now that have chosen to spin off different assets. And Chevron's always been one that talked about integration and the value of, of a strong integrated company. Can you discuss that a bit? Sure. There have always been different segments to our business, from operating service stations through exploration-only companies. And then there have been some that have been fully integrated throughout that chain. Uh, Chevron has remained an integrated company where we uh, are putting most of our money into the exploration and production business, producing oil and gas out of the ground. Mm -hmm. But we have felt that there's real value in having integrated operations. What's happening today in our business is the resources that we're developing are more challenged, if you will. They require more processing at the field level. Mm -hmm. And so the line is very blurred between a refinery and, say, an upgrader when you're producing heavy oil, or the facilities that it takes to, pr to, to process the a uh, sour stream that's coming out of uh, the, the oil and gas in Kazakhstan. If, if, if you went to Kazakhstan to our Tengiz operation and you saw the producing facilities, it would look a lot like a refinery to you. And so the LNG plants uh, that we're putting in place, those, those look a lot like big processing facilities. And so the line I is very blurred. And, and so, so whether you're an integrated company or not, you are going to have these big facilities and the expertise that's, uh, that's drawn fundamentally from the refining side of the business. And so we're, we're in both businesses today. Yeah, actually one of the big projects that we're working on here, and Dave should be smiling in the back of the room, is this infrastructure idea. So while people have moved from the peak oil to energy independence tomorrow, there's a lot that has to happen in between in terms of investment and matching crude quality, not just volume, with refinery configurations. We've got natural gas, liquids, and oil as a continuum. But now fractionators, pipelines, rail, <laughs> there's a whole host of things that have to go in between. Well, the opportunity in the U.S., we, we tend to put it in, in terms of natural gas or oil, right. but, but you're exactly right. We're producing oil, gas, natural gas liquids in many different locations, and we need pipeline infrastructure, and we need, uh, and if we're going to take full advantage of it, we're going to, be a, we're going to need to um, operate uh, and, and permit petrochemical plants. Yep. And so when, when I think about the energy renaissance that's taking place in this country, um, my concern and what I advocate is uh, let's celebrate that, but let's be sure that we put in place the policies that will enable that to happen. And so I'll give you three examples okay. uh, of that. One, tax policy. We can talk about that if you like, but tax policy has to support this. Um, access. 85% of our continental shelf is off limits to development. The increases in production that we're seeing in this country are happening on private lands, not so much on public lands. Right. Um, and then we need to be sure that the EPA and the actions that they take are supportive of all of these developments. Um, I do have concerns about some of the actions that are being taken by the EPA. It, it happens in the, in the basement <laughs> somewhere, but uh, the cost-benefit analysis needs to be very real and, and, uh, and, and thoughtfully done to be sure that the regulations that are put in place um, won't have unintended consequences. Okay, well, so actually you've moved right into the energy policy realm. Um, I might differ a little bit with John if he's still here. But the notion that um, the, the triangle, the economic, foreign policy, environmental piece we actually used in one of the NPC studies, now that's become the landmark or the, 
the template uh, for people measuring uh, policy effectiveness. And it's really kind of a trade-off issue, right? So at a time of great change, a lot of people have different views of energy policy, but the optimum energy policy doesn't fit with the optimum environmental policy or the optimum farm policy, and it's all trade-offs. So what's your kind of wish list? You mentioned taxation and access. What else is out there? Well, when, when people, I said when people think about policy, that we think about affordability, we think about security, and we think about environmental objectives. Unfortunately, when we talk about energy, we tend to do it in a stovepipe fashion. Yeah. We'll, we'll, do it, we'll do it one or the above. I love renewables, for example. Yeah. Uh, we're we're uh, the largest renewables producer amongst ma major oil companies, but it has to be affordable. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be sure where we have mandates or very significant subsidies that we're putting in place, are those ultimately going to deliver affordable energy that will compete? In an era of very precious resources in terms of government spending, where is the right place to put our money? And sometimes we'll, we'll view these in, in isolation. Um, a, a controversial area that, that gets a lot of discussion is greenhouse gas emissions. Right. And th that, that's a hard subject. It's a global issue. And we, we can talk about that a, a little bit, but we have to be sure that the policies we put in place um, do more than just make us feel better. Actually, that's what's happening in Europe. There's a facade of uh, what Germany's energy policy looks like and what it really is. So. Well, Germany has put in place uh, very strong uh, subsidies for renewables, and now they see that power costs are three times what they are in the United States. And it, it, it's okay if you want to put these policies in place, but, but we need to tell, in our case, the American people what the cost is going to be and be transparent about it. I think, I think Germany is finding out that this is very expensive and it's tough for industry and it's tough for their consumers, and now they're they're rethinking some of it. It's not that renewables are bad, right. but all these have to be affordable. And it's more difficult even in the United States now because if you've got a situation where demand <laughs> is continually growing, okay, <laughs> where demand was continually growing, uh, nuclear and renewables could slot in, but with flatter declining demand, it's almost a, a one for one competition. Well, I like competition, and I'm, I'm happy to face competition. I think what we're seeing in, in the U.S., some of those unintended consequences, you could think about the renewable fuel standard, for example, right. uh, biofuels <laughs> in the United States. Um, right now we have this uh, interesting circumstance where to meet the federal requirements under the renewable fuel standard, more biofuels need to be blended in. And we've hit what's called the blend wall in this country, where engine manufacturers won't certify gasoline with more than 10% ethanol in it, but we're required to blend more than 10%. So what would you do if you were me? Would you sell a product that engine manufacturers won't certify? I'm not going to do that. Uh, others aren't going to do that. The alternative will be to export that product. So what will happen to prices? They'll rise. So the EPA has indicated that we can, you, can, it, you can now sell up to 15% ethanol but the engine manufacturers haven't certified it except for 5% of vehicles. So th this is an example where, where unintended consequences of policy can have negative effects on consumers. And this will come to a head at some point, right. but, it, but it's one of those issues that, uh, that we deal with every day. Well, it'll come to head rather soon because I think the blend wall, 900,000 barrels a day and an 8.7 million barrel a day demand <laughs> cycle means you're going to be in excess of 10%. So. Well, Chevron is long rins, and so <laughs> we're, we're just going to watch so this. come and talk to John. We're just going to watch this happen. <laughs> Excellent. So let me remind you, if you've got questions you want to write down, we've got people in the back of the room that will pick them up and bring them forward, and then we can have this more of a particip participatory discussion. Um, one of the things I did want to talk to you about, and this will diverge just a little bit, but there's a lot of things that Chevron does in the technology space and the social development space that's beyond traditional oil and gas. And I know you're very proud of it, but it's one of those stories that doesn't get told often. So. Well, we, spend a bit of time we do it. spend a lot of time on technology. I have uh, my former chief technology officer in the audience, so I should probably let him come up and talk, <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about that. But uh, we, we do spend a great deal of time on technology, first in our conventional business, because we've been able to, to drill uh, in places we never thought we could before. We're able to see under salt we never thought right. we could before. We're able to drill deeper than we ever have before. The whole um, hydraulic fracturing business has been facilitated by directional drilling and fracturing technology. So in our conventional business, we've made a great deal of progress. But we also in, have invested considerably over the last few years to try to find an affordable way to do biofuels, for example. Right. Now, um, we haven't cracked the code yet, mm -hmm. uh, but we've been trying to find which feedstocks will work at scale 
and which conversion technology will work, and how do you put those together with a supply chain that will produce a profitable product. Right. And it's interesting, the, the mandates that have been put in place both in California and uh, federally assumed a certain rate of progress. And it's proven to be more difficult, not just for us, but for others. And you know, th there are a couple examples that, I, that I'll give you. People talk about the potential of, say, algae-based biofuels. Great, lots of research. But to meet the, the, the renewable fuel standard for biofuels using uh, algae-based biofuel would require a, a settling pond the size of Lake Erie. And so the, the scope and scale, I mean, 40% of our corn crop now is going just, just to provide 10% of the gasoline pool in this country. So the scope and scale and difficulties of putting, finding the right crops, putting in place a system that will generate significant volumes that will be material and affordable are really hard. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I talk about renewables that can be produced profitably and at scale. We do have a geothermal business. Um, hydropower has been popular around the world for many years. Thanks. Um, renewables have their place and they will grow. But it, if you look around the world, right now there, there are roughly $500 billion a year in demand subsidies, price subsidies that are being given to consumers because affordable energy is so important. So what makes us think that consumers around the world and governments around the world are going to want to push unaffordable energy into their system. I don't advocate those demand subsidies. In fact, it's one of the areas that, that, that from a policy point of view, the U.S. Can help, um, can help around the world. But that just tells you the challenge. It, we have to find solutions that are affordable, and I think that's part of the reason that Secretary Chu had a study done for him last year, um, Frank, that I know you're, you're very familiar with, and it talked about uh, a better thing to do with the precious monies that we have that we're investing in new fuels technology to really focus on advanced stage, early stage research, uh, pre-commercial research, to see if we can make step changes in advanced materials, biofuels, and things of that sort so that we can produce affordable alternatives to hydrocarbons. Yeah. John and I were in Saudi Arabia at the beginning of this year, and one of the questions, uh, so the reality of the, the tide oil and shale gas phenomenon in the United States, given where they were five or six years ago when we were asking the Saudis to increase their production, um, and what that meant for global markets. But the other side of that was that what's the policy going forward, because there's a number of other countries that look to be on the verge of also increasing supply. So U.S. policy with respect to you know, Iraq or Iran in terms of an accommodation or uh, post-Chavez Venezuela, what that looks like. So when you assess um, prospects around the globe, so now there's a very real possibility. You talked about the rock. You look at the rocks first, right? So you make sure that the geology has the resources that you need. And then you look at geopolitical risk and commercial risk and economic risk. But the portfolios now have to be changing as well. And even though you have this broad expanse of, of prospects that you can deal with, there's a pecking order of where you go. So for you all to decide to go into Russia, um, but maybe not into Iraq, how does that work through the executive committee and, and evaluation? Well, I don't know if I can give you all our Without secrets. Without getting uh, no uh, secrets in terms um, of the business but, model. Uh, no, the, the truth is there's plenty of resource out there, actually. Uh, you know, I've said if every government were like Singapore, oil would be about 30 or 40 dollars a barrel. <laughs> and so there, it, there is no shortage of resource right. in the world. There's a shortage of... Which has uh, changed from a decade ago. Oh, it, it is. And yeah. it's not just shale resources. Yeah. It's, it's, it's elsewhere. Uh, but you have to have a lot of things in place. You have to have the right commercial terms. You have to have the right physical security environment. You have to have the right community environment. You need a lot of things for those to come together. So we consider all of those when thinking about where, where we want to operate. Mm -hmm. And we're willing to take, we're willing to balance those risks. In some cases, you have low geologic risk and a little bit higher political risk. But we know that uh, we've been very good at developing the kinds of relationships right. that are needed to, to, to be successful. It's routine for us to be in a country 50, 75, 100 years. And what we've learned over time is if you're sensitive to what the host government wants, right. Um, I mean, I can give, give you an example. West Africa, in Angola and Nigeria, 85 to 90 percent of our employees are Angolans and Nigerian nationals. Okay. It's very important. They want local content, so we develop local suppliers. They want us to be engaged with communities, so we've been very strong in, in particularly in areas of, of health and education in those countries. And 
uh, we, we try to be responsive to all the things that the government asks for. And uh, the, the day you wake up in a country and you're taking more than they feel giving. you're giving, yeah. whether it's in taxes and, and development and uh, uh, developing local industries, uh, that's when you know y you're going to be challenged. But that also must pose problems in some emerging economies because it's perceived to be the deep pockets you get into be building infrastructure and running facilities, whether it's hospitals or insurance networks, that typically oil companies don't like to do long term. Right? Well, one of the things we've learned over time is that the best thing for us to do is to partner when we come in. Okay. Instead of coming in and dictating, well, we're going to build a hospital, we try to engage with local communities first, but also with organizations like USAID and, and other NGOs. And we focus greatly on capacity building. We have found in the past that if you just build a hospital and leave it, 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 it doesn't, it's not sustainable. Right. So you have to have staff at, at that institution. And so in, in the partnerships that we've formed uh, through the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative, for example, we do focus on the capacity side of it, uh, not just the construction side. So this one comes from the day traders in the room. So <laughs> we talked about not diving down into specifics, but one of them is, so Chevron's plans in the Arctic and with global LNG, what does Australia look like? Uh, well, that's a broad question. Um, I I'll say that we, have, we operate in Arctic and Arctic-like conditions, but the LNG projects that, that so. we have, uh, as the question indicates, the biggest ones that we have are in Australia. We have, we have two, two projects there, the Gorgon and Wheatstone project. And uh, to put those in perspective for the group, the combined spend for these two projects by us and our partners is $85 billion. We've got about $45 billion of that. So that's, that's a lot of money, even in our family, uh, to, that, that, that we're- That's real money. That, that, that we're <laughs> investing. And I think that's one of the, one of the challenges in, in the LNG business is that it is a big capital business. And companies like Chevron and others aren't going to make those kinds of commitments without contracts right. uh, ahead. So a lot is said about the dynamics of the LNG market today. But fundamentally, with all the resource that is out there, Putting together a successful project requires many things to go right. You have to have alignment with the host government, you have to have alignment with customers and partners, and you have to be willing to put those big investments in, knowing that the benefits will be realized over the next 30 or 40 years. And you have to have confidence in the government in the area where you're operating in order to make those kinds well, of investments. Well, this is so that the above ground pieces, whether it's uh, you know competitive uh, the producing sector or um, service company sector, steel, infrastructure, fiscal terms, right? And that takes a while to, to evolve and develop. So even though these prospects are there, that also delays the... Well, the, there have there been some st studies done of how long it takes right. to actually put an LNG project together, and the history has been it's 15 to 20 years, right. actually. Gorgon was discovered in 1980. Now, it's, it's high in CO2, which is being <coughs> stored, stored in the ground. It's one of the unique aspects of that of that project, mm -hmm. but it takes longer than people think to put these types of projects together for the, for, for the reasons uh, we described. And uh, supply will eventually be fairly well balanced with demand. Not all the projects that are put forward will go. Well, well, right. And so uh, I think that that's the healthy tension that exists between customers, mostly in Asia, and prospective producers. Uh, it's in the producer's interest to talk about the project they've got. It, customers talk about all the all the opportunities, and there's this, there's this bargaining that goes on before projects ultimately go to final investment decision. And right. typically, what takes a project to final investment decision are reliable contracts exactly. that, that allow the producer to earn a fair return. Well, we were speaking upstairs before um, John came down, and just the thought about and the LNG side, that if you lined up all the, the applications that are there, no one expects 38 BCF to be exported out of the United States just because of the competitive impacts where other resources are around the world. And then when you do regas or liquefaction, transportation, and build these facilities, the prices change. So the market is pretty dynamic. Well, it is. One of the things I've been encouraged by with the administration is that they have supported the export of, of right. natural gas. Uh, one of the things the US has always stood for is free trade. And I think it's important. People watch what we do. If we're perceived as hoarding resource in some way, it sets a very poor example. Uh, for, other, for other countries. So when we should act in a manner that's consistent with free trade principles. And I've been pleased that a couple of projects have been, mm -hmm. been permitted, and, and uh, I, I, hope, I hope more will be. And I'll say we're not a part of any of them either. Well, we have an interest in a Canadian project. But um, it's the right thing from a policy point of view. 
we did a gas study that we released a couple of months ago, and Senator Johnston was here and made the comment about, we like to be a free trade country when we were importing. <laughs> that wouldn't it be a nice idea if we have the resources that we continue that trend? He's, he's more articulate than I am. <laughs> Uh, EIA yesterday put out a report on global shale development yeah. and listed a number of countries based on USGS and some limited drilling that's out there. And, and this is very early in the process. But they identified China and Algeria, um, Argentina. From your perspective, are there specific areas that you've already identified as the next areas that you're really seriously looking at? There are some shales that we know a lot about. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the United States and Western Canada, we know a lot about them because we've had conventional oil and gas operations in the same area, and we've drilled through them. So we know the quality of the shale. We know a lot about them. What's the organic content? What's their porosity, permeability, all those good things. But if you look at shales that are around the world, in some cases, there's little or no infrastructure. There hasn't been drilling. All we know is these are big blocks of shale, and a lot of drilling and evaluation will be needed. And so I would say these shales are prospective, but uh, it will take a lot of time. Um, in our case, where we've uh, emphasized um, you know, our interests, the Marcellus Shale, uh, some of the shales in, in West Texas, uh, the Duvernay in Canada, uh, we're negotiating a transaction in Argentina, uh, okay. which is an oil-prone area, and we've taken on leases in Central Europe. I would say on that spectrum, the Central Europe is the most exploration-like, uh, because there isn't a lot, uh, there hasn't been uh, a lot of natural gas produced there. Um, and, of course, the ones in the Marcellus and in right. the U.S. are uh, producing today. Mm -hmm. And there's population density issue. Th there, there are, depending upon yeah. where these resources are. Okay. Um, given the growth in gas, when you look at um, oil growth, now there's a tremendous opportunity there, but the price disparity, how much do you see natural gas starting to penetrate either transportation or, or specialty markets like fuels we're now using? Uh, natural gas as a, as a fuel it used to be a, a supplemental feedstock for refinery now mm. in some cases it's bypassing the refinery so what do you see the prospect for growth on oil versus gas well we do have this blessing of yeah, relatively low price thing. natural gas and while we expect prices to rise uh, a, a little bit because right. we, we actually have a surplus today we do think it will be affordable and very competitive for a long time mm -hmm. in this country so it's, it's a wonderful opportunity the, the easy things for us to use the natural gas for our power generation, and it competes head-on with coal, and uh, I think we ought to let the market decide, and uh, natural gas likely will take share over time, mm -hmm. and so I think that's, that's a good thing. In the transportation fleet, it's, it's a little more complicated. There's infrastructure that's required. There already are natural gas vehicles out there. You need centralized fueling facilities, uh, and uh, so to me, the next logical step is in corridors, trucking corridors, right. where you, you can have a limited number of sites, uh, heavily trafficked areas, and gradually over time, I think, I think uh, a higher percentage will go to natural gas v vehicles, uh, perhaps first in trucking and then with other types of centralized fleets. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's, uh, I think that's a good opportunity. Whether it will make inroads into the personal transportation vehicle, business, right. Um, I, I think that will be a little bit slower, just because the build out of preference too. yeah the build out of infrastructure and the some of the some of the personal characters. What about marine? Um, well, I guess that's po people are talking about that. Yeah. I think it's possible, um, but again, you have to build out the infrastructure. You have to build out the infrastructure. Okay. Uh, as a native Californian, what are your views on whether California will develop the Monterey and its resources? <laughs> Well, uh, California has been an oil-producing state for a long time. Uh, people, people think California is being pretty green, and I, I'd have to say it is. Uh, but we also produce a lot of oil in Southern California. It's a good business for, for Chevron. And the Monterey Shale has been a source rock uh, for a lot of that production. And I think there are different opinions today about whether the Monterey Shale will be as prolific as some of the other shales. You could get into some of the technical arguments around how fractured it is, how much uh, oil may have moved and migrated from those shales, but I think the easy answer is to let the industry find out <laughs> uh, how, how much is there, and we'll see. Well, and Governor Brown seems to be in favor of increasing production. Well, he, uh, the, the governor on this subject, uh, I think, has been very, very constructive. I think mm -hmm. he understands that the oil and gas business uh, can make a real contribution to the state, and I think he's, he, of course, will want good standards, uh, as everyone will, but again, we've been fracking wells there a long right. time. And the oil industry is actually not new right. in, in, in Southern California. Yeah. So I think if, if the industry responds reasonably, 
uh, to, the, to, to the concerns that might be raised. Uh, we'll have a good opportunity to see how much the Monterey Shale can contribute. Okay. There's a question here on seismicity, and I know Dr. Don Paul is here as well, and we've been working on a project with them in the University of California, Southern California, on seismic events. There was a concern, uh, when, in fact, when we started looking at the shale gas revolution, that it was almost like whack-a-mole, whether it was you know, drill fluids or water use, and seismicity came up. There's most of the cases of seismicity, I think all the cases of seismicity, have been related to reinjection. Yeah. Well, induced seismicity, as they call it, um, you know, more simply, does does do shale operations cause earthquakes? Um, oil oil drilling activity and water injection activities have known for it's for a long time can cause small scale seismic events. I don't think that's a new issue. Um, uh, so I think some care needs to be taken in how we approach this. But I've seen no evidence that it's in any way material. And so uh, the issues that have come up, for example, in, in Ohio were around water injection wells and where you choose to inject water, produce water, not around the shale operations themselves. And as we recycle all the water, that issue simply goes, goes away. Um, so it, it's, it's an area for study, an area for concern, but I, I'm not aware of any um, material risk to this when you're talking about 1.0 events on the Richter scale, things like that sort. California has hundreds of those every day. Um, so I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to dismiss the issue, but I, I think it's been studied actually for a long time mm -hmm. in our industry. Well, and now that we have uh, at least diagnostic tests that can run on old injection wells and just see if there was any seismic activity, so reduce the pressure, reduce the volume, right. and take care of that. Right. You need to be thoughtful about where you're injecting water into the ground near faults. Yeah. So these are showstoppers. Shouldn't and, be. Uh, big data. So when we get to the point where, and we, these are pretty far ranging, so thank you for putting up with this. But the notion that um, now that we can map the subsurface geologically, we also have a better sense of the hydrology. A lot of this data is going to states, and one of the sub questions here is state versus federal regulation. What do we do with all this data to get a better picture? It seems to be more complex and more complete, but it's a mosaic. And it's just a lot of uh, ability to, uh, it takes a lot of ability to absorb it and figure out what the policy ought to be. Well, I'm, I'm not sure quite the context for the question, but I, I will tell you, our industry, and I think every company today, there's no shortage of data that's generated. Right. We get lots of data. The challenge is to turn it into information <laughs> and, and to capture it and use it. And so that's where we're focusing our energies. For example, on an offshore drilling rig, we have, uh, disconnected and uh, information systems uh, from the different service companies. If we can capture all that information, bring it into a central repository onshore, we can do a better job of monitoring offshore wells. Right. And for example, we're doing that. And so capturing and using data intelligently, capturing uh, compressor characteristics. Uh, we have a centralized si uh, system for capturing all the data on how compressors are performing and having experts on compressors uh, evaluate that data so that you can do predictive, you can, be, you can predict Predictive failures tools. Yep. and do maintenance uh, in advance of that. Those are the kinds of things we can do with uh, harnessing all the data that our systems generate today. So, um, to me, there, the applications are, are many and those are just a couple. Price sensitivity. Yes. We've seen on the gas side that in, in some ways the industry was a victim of its own success. Mm -hmm. A lot of natural gas brought the price down until you get the demand pulled to get it there. If we're actually looking at a lot of oil supply, when you start putting extra oil on the market, the good news is that uh, OPEC spare capacity should go up, and so you ought to take away some of the volatility. But there's also people that are projecting now a, a substantial drop in oil prices. And then at what level are some of the new finds and prospects economic? Um, we, we do fundamental work around supply and demand for both oil and natural gas. And I'll tell you, gas is a lot harder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so I'll, st I'll stick with oil for the moment. But we take a proprietary view of what's likely to happen. So first we have an understanding from the resource side, and then we, we layer on politics and what we know about activity in a given country. For example, we operate in many of the countries uh, that produce a lot of oil, and so we have a view of when projects are, are likely to take place. So we're able to get a pretty good handle on oil supply, and we've been reasonably successful in predicting that. Um, one notable exception, we've, we've, we've been a little light on the prediction of how much oil would come from the U.S. in the shale operations. But even in, in that context, well, but, <laughs> but even in that context, you're talking about 86 million barrels a day of oil that's produced, uh, 90 million that are consumed, including processing gains and biofuels. So 86 million barrels a day. 
tight resources today, shale, oil, is about two, a little over two. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go to over four. So if you put that into, con and that's going to take 10, 10 years right. or more. So if you put that into context, it's manageable. The, the, we don't believe there's as much surplus capacity in the world as gets talked about. Yeah, we agree. In, in our view, the only real surplus capacity is in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and if you think about a decline curve in our business and what happens if prices drop and the, the, the supply response, it tends to be self-correcting. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean you couldn't see temporary uh, conditions, doesn't mean you, you couldn't see a drop in prices, but our view is that that decline curve is relentless. And even though demand only grows at about 1% a year, people think of it as a low growth business. The growth isn't 1%. The growth is 1% plus replacing the decline. And you need new resources all the time. Think of it as a, just a treadmill. <laughs> and you're, you're going uphill on that treadmill. <laughs> and you're always, you're always having to pedal a little, bit, a little bit faster because of the declines that are inherent in some of the large reservoirs around the world. So we tend to be uh, a little more optimistic over the long term. Technology is an offsetting factor mm -hmm. there. But it, it, it will take robust pricing in order to, for the industry to be able to afford the developments that, mm -hmm. that are out there. And if there isn't a match, developments won't happen, the decline curve will take over, you know, and you'll, you'll get That's that so balance of supply and demand. Gas is a bit of a different story. It's a more localized market mm -hmm. in the United States. The, sh the shale opportunities in this country overwhelm um, the existing supplies. Uh, shale gas produces and comes out of the rock a little easier than, than liquids do. And um, we missed it, and everybody else did too. And it's a blessing for American consumers. Yeah. And I think we'll have this distant, this uh, difference um, on an energy equivalent basis between gas and oil. Uh, we think for a long time. Mm -hmm. So just the, staying with it, the oil side, when you talk about depletion, that uh, five percent depletion rate, that's four and a half million barrels a day per year, right? So project that to 2020, and that's just to keep you level, and then you have to build over and above that. So it is. It's a difficult thing. Yeah, in our case, we talk about a decline rate of 3 to 4 percent a year, mm -hmm. but that's after a quarter of our capital that's spent. So oil, oil wells actually decline at, on average, maybe 15 percent a year. So we do a lot of infill drilling and other activity to reduce that decline to, to 3 or 4 percent. So in our case, we're spending $36 billion this year. Nine billion of that is, what, is on what I call background or small capital projects mm -hmm. just to hold that decline to 3 to 4 percent. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we're that different than other companies. So then to arrest that 3 or 4 percent and grow on top of that, you have to make very large investments in capital projects. And, and that's what we do. And if, if companies don't do that, then, then you get, you that, behind. Then, then you get that, that decline curve taken over. And that's a bigger problem for, obviously, for bigger companies to replace your reserves every year. It, it is a challenge. We produce a billion barrels, yeah. uh, a billion barrels a year of, of oil and gas combined. Uh, now, we're fortunate. We have a good queue of projects right. out there. Uh, the growth profile that we're showing between now and 2017 is, uh, through the projects that are already under construction, is about 5% a year. So it's, it's a little uneven. It tends to be back-end loaded. But the, the Gorgon and Wheatstone projects mm -hmm. that I d described, the offshore developments, uh, Jack St. Malo, Bigfoot, th these sorts of projects in the Gulf of Mexico, all are contributing to that. Um, but but uh, as they say, they do cost money. When you talked about Gorgon, you talked about it being CO2 rich. So you're actually using CCS technology. Well, it's carbon storage right. is the way I would describe it. It's, it's basically CO2 that's entrained in the natural gas that comes offshore. We're separating and, and then taking the CO2. And rather than venting it, as might have taken place in the past, uh, it's being stored uh, in a reservoir in an aquifer um, underground. And we've worked very closely with the Australian government. It's, it's really a fairly unique project. And it, it's, it's costing Chevron and our partners a couple billion dollars to do it. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those examples of things that we're doing that may not get a lot of coverage. But it's something that uh, we feel is the right thing to do. because. The CO2 percentage in the gas is in excess of 10 percent, and so it's, it's important to not invent that CO2. Okay. When you start looking at the, the difference between, so the dilemma that strikes me for the administration has been a uh, welcome addition with oil and gas, but it perpetuates a fossil fuel future. So how do you um, balance uh, getting to a, or, or promote the idea of getting to a lower carbon economy and deal with greenhouse gas emissions? Well, at the we, same time that you well, we started at the outset talking about affordable energy, and right. if you take the premise that we want to sustain the standard of living that we have today, mm -hmm. and for countries around the world that aspire and want to realize our standard of living, you do need to put forth affordable affordable solutions, 
And so the, the, the reality is that carbon emissions are going to rise because countries, from my conversations with leaders around the world, their priority is to feed their people. Their right. priority is to give them light, heat, and mobility. And whatever, whatever your view of the science might be, most governments are going to act consistent with that priority, even if they have some concerns about greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Th th that, that is going to be the priority. So I think what the Western world, what the wealthy uh, countries can do, is focus on finding new ways to put more affordable solutions that are less carbon intensive in, into the hands of these people. Now, uh, I will say there are, there, there's some low-hanging fruit. There, right. there are some things that we can do. I talked about subsidies earlier that are not very productive, that, that promotes wasteful practices. Energy conservation yes. is very significant. We, we have a for-profit energy efficiency business. Uh, there's a lot that can be done, not just here, but around the world. We're actually very energy efficient in this country. Most of the world is not. And there, there's tremendous low-hanging fruit around energy efficiency. And then, of course, uh, promoting the use of natural gas um, is something uh, that, I, that I think can displace more uh, carbon-intensive sources of fuel in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and then advanced uh, you know, research, research into making um, our products more energy efficient and in delivering lower, lower carbon products. But th the idea that you can force something that's very expensive into the market, you may be able to do that in a limited way in wealthy nations. I, I, think, I, I don't think it's going to work very well in some of the Emerging Some economies. of the emerging economies. And that's where the growth is looking to come. And that's where the growth is. Two-thirds of the economic growth over the next 20 years is coming from developing countries. If you, you, know, if you look at a graph that any organization puts out, greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. and Western Europe are about flat over the next 20 years. But there's an explosion in growth in the developing world. And I think that's the issue that we're going to have to address. And just telling those people, you can't have affordable energy, Probably isn't, probably isn't going to work. Yeah, you have social upheaval as well. <laughs> well, the, 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 there, there, there are yeah. social issues in, yeah. in countries, and I travel to them all the time. I know what their priorities are. Excellent. So one of the questions that comes up uh, repeatedly, so what does the energy market look like, and what, what does Chevron look like in 2025? Well, in 2025, we have a pretty good idea of what we'll look like because the lead time on some of these, some projects, of these projects are, are pretty long. And so Chevron uh, today is uh, about 30% natural gas, 70% oil. Okay. Uh, by that time, we'll be more, more, more like 40% natural gas, maybe a little more than that, and 60% uh, oil. Okay. So we'll be gassier, if yeah. you will, because of the LNG projects I described. Uh, I think we'll have more of our- We'll rephrase that when you- <laughs> <laughs> We, we'll, we'll probably have m more projects that have a longer life to them. Uh, okay. LNG projects go on a, a long time. Uh, our projects in Kazakhstan and elsewhere uh, tend to go on for a long time. So we'll have a higher proportion of our projects, in, in, of, of our money in long-lived projects uh, over time. It's the nature of some of the resources that we're uh, developing. Uh, I have other internal objectives that, that I have. I certainly uh, hope we can continue to make the progress on things like process safety. I mean, we have the lowest injury rate right. in the industry. We had our lowest spill volume ever last year, but we're not at zero yeah. in, in some of these areas. Um, we've, we, you know, we've made mistakes uh, in our operations, and we're, we're doing a lot of work to reduce the chances of those kinds of incidents uh, going forward. Well, and it is a risk. It's inherently a risky business, and managing the risk is just really important. Well, you, you can't take risk to zero, right. but we can put in place, uh, the, steadily improve our practices, and make sure we first understand what the risks are, and then do, the, do everything we can to mitigate those risks. You've touched upon um, policy a couple times now. Uh, one of the things that, that I think is missing, and there's several people in the audience that have either been in the government or aspired to be in the government, the, the business model and the collaboration with industry, how do you make that better? Um, collaboration with government industry? Yeah. Well, I spend a lot of time here. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in Thank you, Maria and Lisa. <laughs> uh, in, in, in Washington. And I, I say that with a, a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but um, I do think that if you don't talk to people, you're not, you're not right, going you're not, to you're not, you're not be very productive. And, and our approach is uh, not to scream from the mountaintops on issues, but to try to collaborate on them. And so we engage in all kinds of studies with government agencies. We, uh, I spend time privately, whether it's on the Hill or within, um, um, in the White House, 
And I, I never go in and say you should do this or you should do that. What I say is here, here will be the consequences and here, here are some alternatives um, that might give you the, the consequences you want right. uh, on, on these issues. And so I think with that engagement, it, it works pretty well. Um, okay. I, I will say it's, it, uh, it sometimes is, is hard publicly to have all of those discussions, but we do so privately and uh, ju usually I have a good audience. And, it's most. It's not always me doing all the talking. Uh, a lot of times, um, I, I'm being asked questions and um, being asked my view, and uh, and and you know, I think the engagement has gotten better and better over time. I, it was always my sense that after Macondo, as catastrophic as it was in the death of 11 people, that it was actually an opportunity for industry and government to re-engage on on the way you do your business. Because I thought that there was a lag both in the technology and the understanding on the government side of what actually was put in place and the need for the industry to step up. And the industry did step up. I think the industry has. And that's why I made the comment I did on what we're doing in the Marcellus Shale. I think w we have a Center for Offshore Safety that right. uh, the API has worked closely with, with government on. And I, I actually think most of my peers know that we need to raise the bar out there. We need to satisfy the concerns that the public has. Expectations are higher than they were. Expectations are high. And they're, they're very high. And they're not, they're not going to get lower. So, but, but we need to get our story out. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, one of the, uh, give, give, you an, give you an area where we, maybe we haven't gotten our story out as well. There's been a lot of controversy around pipelines. But pipelines are the safest way to move oil, gas, right. and products. Um, they're anywhere from 25 to 30 percent, uh, 30 times safer, depending on how you want to talk mm -hmm. about it. They're obviously cheaper. And we got two and a half million miles of pipeline in this country. And so the idea that we shouldn't have pipelines, that, that is the way, the preferred way to move oil and gas. And pipeline safety has actually improved. Right. There have been incidents. But if you look at the record over the last decade or two, uh, pipeline safety has improved. And spill performance is better. But um, we, we need to get those views across, and we need to um, get, get alignment that that's, that's the right way to be. Well, and the products. average American isn't aware how extensive the pipeline system is, right? Well, that, that's right. There are pipelines everywhere. Now, the industry needs to do its part. In some cases, pipelines are aging, and we need to be sure that the diagnostics we have uh, around uh, corrosion and, and other events, uh, that we're on top of those things. But by and large, it's still much safer than moving oil, oil by, yeah, by, by rail, rail. Or, 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 or truck. Okay. So in terms of all the changes that have occurred and all the things you've seen in your career, how would you rate this, this period in time? Uh, optimism, unbridled optimism, cautious optimism, happy that you're still <laughs> in the industry where you are, and, well, and prognosis for the future. Well, um, let's see. Uh, over the last 12 years since the Chevron-Texaco merger, Chevron's generated $200 billion in wealth for our shareholders. So it's been a pretty good run <laughs> um, for us. And I still think the good days and best days are ahead. Are ahead. And I know that there's a desire in some circles to, to see a diminished uh, presence for the oil and gas business. But the reality is, uh, I think we do good things. We bring light, heat, mobility to people. And I think there's going to be a need for that for many years to come. And I think we can steadily improve our practices and, and, and make progress on environmental and other issues. But I think it's a good time to be in our business, and I think there are fewer companies like mine that can deliver the technology and the whole range of things that governments want as a part of their oil and gas business. So I think it's a good time, and that's reflected in the portfolio that we have, which is as deep, and we, can, we know what we're going to be doing 10 years from now based on what we have in our portfolio today. Mm -hmm. So it's a good time to be in our business, I'm, and I'm, uh, I'm just fortunate to, uh, to, be with <laughs> to be with a good company. And we're fortunate to have had you. <laughs> so this right. notion of the more that we have uh, these kinds of uh, dialogue and, and uh, I would say uh, content-rich discussions on what is actually going on, it, it raises the level of pub public discourse and education in this city, certainly, and helps the policy. And uh, I would just look at my watch, and I can't believe an hour's already gone by. But um, there's a bunch more questions, and we'll certainly do this again and if we have the opportunity. But I just want to thank you personally for, for allowing us, giving us the time to do this, and then making yourself available. Well, oh, Frank, thanks. CSIS is a wonderful organization. Uh, John, thank you, wherever, you, wherever you're sitting. I thank you very much. And Frank, thank you for hosting Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Thank you. We have one.